Okay. So I guess we can start now. So welcome everybody to the uh, advanced session about geospatial data. Um, we will begin with uh, Michael, who is talking about or will give us an introduction to uh, geodata in R, well, and also a general introduction. And yeah, well, um, during the talk, uh, if you have any questions, you can just write them in the chat, and then I will collect them for the end. All right, so the stage is yours, Michael. <laughs> so yeah, I will disable the video. Okay, so thanks, Daniel. Um, I'm going to start with the introduction. I'll just share my screen. Okay, so this is going to be an introduction to to geo data, and um, we're going to soon start looking also how to work with it with R. But this is going to be a really, really basic um, basic presentation. So the first question, the fundamental, but not really a very fancy question, what is geospatial data? Basically, it's everything data that can be pointed to somewhere on the earth for now, at least. So when we think of pointing somewhere on the earth, we usually work with um, the, the longitude and latitude coordinates. So the, this, Typically, the Earth has been divided into um, latitude and longitude. The longitudes run from the North Pole to the South Pole. The zero one is through uh, London, which is an old historical convention. And then you have 180 degrees going east and 180 degrees going west. And the same is for latitude, which starts at the equator, where you have zero degree latitude. You have 90 degrees going up to the North Pole and 90 degrees going down. It's basically when we talk about spatial data, this is our fundamental. Now, what is the problem with spatial data is that uh, our world is a sphere, but we usually look at spatial data in 2D on maps or things like that. And the problem arises when you take an orange, for example, try to peel it and want to lay out the peels flat on the table. Uh, especially if you want to lay them in a table that they stick together from just one uh, contiguous piece. I wish you good luck with that. And you will see that it's not really possible to have a, a rectangular form like you see here, or even some other forms without squeezing or pressing the piece in some, some distorted way. So projections are fundamental. When, when working with spatial data, and I will give you just a brief overview for this. And the issue is that Mathematically, the exact projection of curved surfaces, so like a sphere on the flat surfaces, is impossible. So you can, projection-wise, you can preserve the shape. This is then called a conformal pro projection. You can preserve the area, equal area projection. You can preserve direction or preserve the distance. But you cannot preserve all of these at once. So you have to always make some kind of a trade of what you want to have in your, in your map. There are also projections that do not preserve any of them, but approximate most of them or the, the interested one ends, uh, as, as one might need. We will look a few, at a few examples of projections. So the first one is the good homolosine projection, which is an equal area projection that is also preserving the shape quite nicely, but at the cost that it has to cut the, 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 the map in, in at, the, at most oceans, and Greenland is cut also in half. Well, this is, an, this is an okay projection for some purposes, for others it might be not. An old one which has been used extensively since, well, since the, I think, 16th century or something, is the Mercator projection. It is a conformal projection, which introduces heavy distortion. So when you look at an Antarctica here, usually it is cut out of the projection because it's just too large than it actually is in, 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 in theory. The Mercator projection is not used today anymore also because it has a, um, this debate has been debated politically because it distorts the, the, the shape and the area. So North America and Europe seem larger than they are as, for example, compared to Africa. When we look, for example, at the good projection where actually Africa is much larger than this. And so it has also been used as a political instrument to um, well, to subjugate other other parts of the world. Although variants of these are still used, for example, the UTM 
projection which splits the whole world into multiple zones of MACDO where the issue is not so strong anymore. The mole wide projection is also often used when you have to display the whole globe, which is also works, but it distorts also a bit the, uh, the shapes, but it is equal area on the other hand. As a conclusion, this was just a brief introduction on projections. You should just keep in mind that different projections ex exist and depending on your need, you might consider using a special projection, especially if you work, for example, with uh, the North or the South Pole or in extreme cases. But in most cases, actually, you don't need to bother for this. The What projection you... Um, you you use is often predetermined by the use case or otherwise the software has uh, really good defaults for for doing this we now come to the next point of of, of geodata which is the spatial data itself so when we talk about spatial data there's uh, two types of data that in which spatial data is usually divided and this is uh, vector data and raster data so uh, vector data, the most common forms that you find are point data, uh, uh, point, let's look at here, line strings and polygons. Line strings are just connected lines and polygons are just a line that is connected where the first and the last point overlap, thus forming a, a kind of a closed surface. Then there's also multivariance of this, so multipoints, multi-line strings, multi-polygons. The issue to have this multivariant is um, to have it in a, in a tidy approach. If you exam imagine, for example, a country which is made up of multiple islands, which will be multiple polygons, and you want to store them in one spatial object or one spatial feature, you will have to use a multi-polygon because otherwise you have to use different polygons or different objects, and then it will not fit into the one row or one feature tidy framework. Raster data, on the other hand, are a bit different to, to vector data in that uh, a raster is usually a regular grid of, of spatial data. It is defined as uh, rectangular cells. In this case, the cells are equal in, in X and Y direction, but that does not have to be the case. It can be also rectangles, so one set can be larger than the other. They are identified by the cell IDs. <clears throat> you will have a, a distance between the, the, the cells in both directions, and you need to somewhere define where you start to count with your raster. Each cell has an ID. It can be stored as a, as a matrix or as a vector, basically, if you know the number of columns and rows and you have cell values associated with this uh, grid, which usually is displayed using some colored values. Then for spatial data, in order to put it, to locate it on our, on our Earth, I mean, with uh, spatial data, you can also just think of a coordinate system that will also be already an, uh, a spatial data, but if you want to go geospatial or to, to, to work on the earth, you need to ha tell the, the, the software or, the, or the, the, the data how how it is linked to the, to the sphere. And this is what CRS, coordinate reference systems are for. They define just how the spatial element relate to the earth. There are two types of coordinate system. The first one is the geographic, which I also introduced at the beginning, which is uh, the longitude and latitude. So there's two coordinates. The elevation is implicit because if you define a point on the on the longitude latitude, elevation is implicit in this case. And there's also a datum. The datum defines what sphere or ellipsoid this Latin long refer to. Uh, the, we usually think of our, our Earth as a, as a perfect sphere, but actually it's more like an ellipsoid. And if we think of all the bulbs and uh, mountains and everything inside, and also the magnetic fields, it is more of, of a bulby ellipsoid. And the uh, datum defines just what, what type of ellipsoid this longitude and latitude refer to. Then the next type of coordinate systems is uh, projected coordinate systems. They have X and Y coordinate, which is often called easting and northing, and they are implicitly on a flat surface, like maps. 
they include an origin and linear units in the in the in the x and y which is usually meters you can convert between any of the two types of geographic and project and also between the multitude of projections that exist there using the the proj library which is also used by all uh, in r and uh, in python as well the information on this coordinate system is uh, usually given as a proj4 string it's called if you see something like this so proj this is the long latitude this is the standard latitude uh, long lat geographic projection which uses the wgs84 datum which is also used by the uh, GPS satellite positioning system. This is the standard geographic projection that one uses. You can also give it an EPSG code. This is just numeric codes assigned to a projection, which in this case 4326 is exactly this one. And the uh, um, WKT, well-known text representation of a CRS. Uh, besides this, there's the spatial information. We are also interested in attributes and values. This is additional information on the spatial object of the point, of the line, of the polygon. This can be, for example, the name of a city, of a point, uh, the country for a polygon, the population, the date of a measurement, if you have a measurement, the temperature, the elevation, or whatnot. And these attributes are stored then along the, the spatial information. And for rasters, the attributes, one calls them cell values. Um, they're not called attributes. Attributes is more for vector data. And the values of the of the rasters must be numeric in most uses. So this was it for, for introduction into geospatial objects. I will now give a very quick uh, intro on the most useful packages in R to work with spatial data. And uh, one stop shop for, for vector data is the SF package. <clears throat> and for raster data, it's the raster package. And also recently the stars packages, though I will show mostly for raster uh, the examples until now. For quick exploration, I use MapView, which is really a, um, that's an easy tool to do it. Uh, there are a ton of other packages to work with spatial data for any need you might imagine to look. Um, Alexander will talk in the next session uh, about visualization, about producing maps, so maps, but you also find a lot of other packages for any other need. So why the SF package? The SF package is the successor to the SP package. Um, and you can think of it as, as an SF object, as a supercharged data frame. So your spatial object uh, is stored in a data frame. The attributes, like for example, the name, the, the population or whatnot, are stored in the data frame columns. And you just have about from these attributes, this column, you have one column that holds the geometry it's called the spatial objects or spatial features, simple features. Uh, in order to, to be a spatial data, we need to also store the CRS. This is just an attribute. And uh, also the extent, the bounding box. This is just uh, um, on the earth, uh, a rectangle which in which all these spatial objects, spatial features fit in there. And the uh, SF objects are tidy in the sense that each row is one object. So one point, line string, polygon, or the multivariant. This is closely integrated into the tidyverse, so you can work with SF objects, with dplyr, with pipes, as you are used with normal uh, tibbles. And it also is integrated into ggplot by providing a known geo. I'll show that later on. And it has a consistent naming function that start with, that SF function start with st underscore. For example, to read in a, a, a spatial object, in this case, a shape file, I downloaded something from, from GADM, uh, you can use the st read function. It gives you information on what it reads, 21 features. That means 21 spatial features. 10 fields is 10 attributes. And we can see it's a multi-polygon. You can see the B box. We can see the coordinate system, which is the standard long lat. And these are the longitude and latitude this holds. Um, we can extract you can see that the class of the polygons is like supercharged, like I said, data frame. So it has a data frame and then you have the SF information on top. So this is basically the, the first things that you see is the additional uh, spatial information. And then the first five features here, just for an example, these are the attributes that are holding the data. And this last column, the geometry, which holds the spatial 
information, the information on the multi-polygons in this case. We can extract some basic information like the bounding box, the CRS objects. I did not print it because this is, uh, it does not print nicely the, the well-known text representation, but you can get the EPSG code or the proj string that I told you before. It is the integration with tidyverse. You can uh, just pipe it into the into the select, for example, to start to to select columns which start with na name, name, also the ones with uh, which or the the rows of the speech feature will start with B in this case. The standard plot method of the uh, of the SV, SF package is not so nice. It plots the first nine features. Uh, might give a good overview, but I prefer for the quick exploration map view. I stored this not in the presentation, but in a separate file, just because of size. But uh, you can, if you run this in, in R, it will open it in a separate view. Map view opens a leaflet package, which um, allows you to zoom, to pan, and uh, to change the, the background also of the of the map. And you can uh, look at your at your at your spatial object. You can also click on the on the different features, which will give you then an, uh, the information on the attributes which this object or this feature ID has. It's a very nice tool to quickly check where your data is or how it looks like. More vector data, we have looked at uh, polygons now. We can also read in some points. This is um, just some places and some lines. These are rivers, which I also took from, from Natural Earth, uh, free homepage. Cropping and intersecting is the one of the first issues dealing with spatial data is when you want to crop or the, reduce the extent of, of your data to, to another one. In this case, our points and lines are global data set, you can see that from the bounding box, this has values for the whole globe and here also almost the whole. And just for visualizing, I want to crop or to uh, the, the points to my, to the area of my polygons in R, this the SD crop function takes just the points objects, which I want to crop. And I give it a second argument to what two I want to crop. So I do not need to tell them manually, set automatically extracts the bounding box from the polygon starter frame. Crop crops it to the bounding box and intersection looks at really where the polygon is and selects only those points that fall within the polygon. So if you look at this um, in the map view, we can see here that the cropped points fall within the rectangle, which is also within the, where the polygon lies into. And if I look at the intersection, this is only the points that are actually within some of the polygon area. Now I plotted the two features. I can also click on the point. This was a lot of attributes, which is not, cannot really see nicely in this case. And then there is just an example. If I also crop the lines and plot different types of lines, uh, that you can use map view to plot different objects, also raster objects, which I do not show here at the moment. So you can see the lines here. I just remove the polygons for this time. Again, with the map, you can also interactively explore the, 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 the objects. Uh, ggplot integration, uh, the SF package gives you three geoms, geom SF for points, lines, and polygons, and uh, draws the appropriate geom, depending on if it's whether the object is points, lines, then we have also text and labels to draw the attributes. And it has a core SF, which makes sure that the layers use the common CRS and use the, the right projection. The stars package also has an own geom. Uh, there you might want to check the down sample argument so that uh, you do not plot every point in the raster, which can get quite big. To use the, the geom SF, you just need to put in the SF object as data. If you want to plot multiple, um, you need to make sure that you have put the data. Otherwise, the geom thinks it's uh, the aesthetics. And you can use your basic ggplot functionality for 
other attributes. Core the surface optional in this case, if uh, it's only a self object, and then you get the uh, GG plot with in this case the size depending of the points depending on the on the population. Uh, menu creating SF job objects is often not needed. The only use case where I encounter this is for point data, where you might receive point data in, in text files and not as shape files or otherwise. So to create an SF objects from, from text file or from a, a dat data frame or table, you have the S S SF command where you put in the, the table argument, you take, a, you need to define the coordinates uh in x and y direction and the coordinate reference system so that's why usually it's best if it they come in long lat otherwise if you do not know the projection it has to you be told you by email or some whatnot and then um do you can create your own sf object let's just look at rasters next it's so already in a raster which has some downscaled average november precipitation a climatological average um, raster is a bit different to the spatial objects, like we talked before, it still has the coordinate reference system. It has the extent, these uh, things that are in common, but uh, it, the raster is a grid, so you can see the dimension, the number of rows, the number of columns, and this is the number of cells is just a product of these. And you can see also the resolution, which is basically the space between two or the, the, the length or the width of the cell or the space between. Um, you can plot the raster. You can see it's a worldwide average precipitation value. The raster object plots uh, only a downsampled version or not all pixels just to be faster. You have also the crop command to crop it to um, certain region. Again, it's if you have uh, an object you want to crop it to, the, for example, the polygons that we read in earlier, we need to convert it first as a spatial object because raster is from before pre-SF times, but uh, the SF people made it very backwards compatible so you can just convert it like this and you plot only the, the raster for the, or you have only an object which shows the, the raster in this bounding box. Mask is the same as intersection, which crops to the actual shape, um, the polygon shapes. Uh, rasters can contain multiple layers, so we, in this case it was only one, but um, you can think of a cube or a 3D uh, array instead of a 2D array. And you, with the raster you can read it, you can define the layer by using a band command or using brick or stack to create a multi-layer raster. To combine points with uh, vector with raster data, there are also a few examples. To extract points from a raster based on points, you can use the extract function and it will give you the values at those points. Exactly. And if you want to, you can then, for example, add them to your points object using dplyr syntax. And just for an example, I uh, looked, I arranged the cities in Germany which were in this SF points object according to the November precipitation. And we can see that, for example, Freiburg is the wettest city in this case, which 94 millimeters of precipitation on average. So this is an example of the integration with the rest. Raster to data frame, if you want to work from for the raster values in a, in a data frame or table way, you can use it with a data frame method. XY gives us also the XY coordinates and an A removes all the NAs, which are um, values. You need to watch out when you do this because rasters can be quite big. Uh, it can easily have be in the billions of observation and you it can get slow. So uh, watch out when creating data frames from rasters. I think I will skip on to the other things. So we have a few time for, for questions. This is just to going the other way around, for example, making a raster out of polygon using the rasterize function, which is then uh, creating, for example, this is a raster for different um, nuts levels in, 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 in creation, in this case, based on the raster that we created before, in the case you want to merge or compare these two data sets. 
There are also a few topics that I have not covered here since it was an introduction, but just if you want to get more information, there are also spatial operations. So on the vector, it's a set operations, transformations. On raster, you can work on the cell values, on the layers. There's reprojection, which is uh, sometimes necessary for data analysis, but for visualization, usually um, not. And for the raster data, this involves interpolation because if you reproject a raster, you um, it's still in the new projection, it still has to be a regular grid and reprojecting, depending on from what projection you go to what a uh, line in one can be a curve in the other, so it's not a rust anymore. So you have to interpolate your new data using some interpolation. File formats I've shown you, uh, in this case, we used sh shape files and geotiffs, which are the most common. In the climate grids, NetCDF is used a lot, but you can also encounter GOGs on ISC or Google KML files. And there's also integration into database of the spatial data, for example, PostGIS, but this will be covered by uh, the talk by Martin. Uh, here's just a few links if you want to learn more. This is a data viz book with a nice intro. This is an in-depth introduction of spatial data with R, and you have the R spatial community with the, for the hardcore technical stuff. So for this, I want to thank you for the attention, and uh, if there are any few questions, I think a few minutes are left. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> um, I think there was a question from Antonio. Um, how would you go about checking intersections between different polygons, or if you have different levels? Uh, how would you say, uh, how would you test which municipalities belong to which states? So I think... Um, yeah, this will probably you will do it um, with um, also what Damon answered the SD yeah. intersect is the same. Uh, you can also the intersection works for points and polygons, but you can also intersect lines with polygons and other polygons with other polygons. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Are there any more questions? Mm. Okay. Maybe a short question. Maybe you said it or yeah. didn't hear it. I don't know. <laughs> but um, when you heard that you, or if you want to create uh, like a map from text data or um, just a table, um, how do you um, tell them or uh, I don't know, uh, say which uh, nut level or which um, level you want to represent it? Or do you have to have files before? So if you want to create a polygon, for example, out of a text data, that will be difficult because then you have to, um, a polygon basically is uh, as many points that are connected. Yeah. So basically each polygon will be a series of points. So if you want to create that manually, you have to have another columns that, or some, some grouping that will give you the, the nuts level or the, or the attributes in order to create this polygon. Okay. So this is not a common case, but it can be done because usually then it's better to store these as shape files or as some in a, in a spatial format also to exchange this data mm -hmm. because this inherently also has the coordinate reference system in it, which uh, otherwise you would need to guess or, or have it somewhere else. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So there's another question from Damon. Um, do you by any chance are also into spatial regression or do you work with spatial? I've I've worked a bit or I tried a bit on 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 that, but uh, I don't understand to what comparison exactly GAMS or GLS. Yeah, um, I think it's a bit different because in the GLS setting you use the the spatial objects, as far as I know, in the correlation structure, but your interest is on the, another another uh, variable. While on the GAMS, you actually also interested in the spatial distribution if you model smooth function for example depending on x and y so i think it's a it's it's a different uh, use case in this case comes with gls the spatial regression is, is always tricky in one hand because the few examples i used often the spatial information is inherent in the spatial correlation and you need to be careful not to uh, confound or combine these issues so uh, yeah okay so I guess, yeah, okay. <laughs> so it's answered Damon's question. Hope. Otherwise, you can always contact me. Otherwise, yeah. Okay. So 
Um, I'm not sure if there aren't any more questions. Then we can go on to the next presentation <laughs> or to the next okay. part. So uh, thank you very much again. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me here. Yeah. <laughs>